Uh, welcome everyone to our third third brown bag for the semester. Um, a little change of um, conditions. Our, we'll only have one speaker today. Our second speaker was ill and was not able to uh, make a presentation. So you actually have extra time if you want to go slow. We have plenty okay. of time for questions. <laughs> if anyone wants to ask a question, uh, go for it. Uh, just chat it to me and I will ask for you. So uh, Kathy Liu is a uh, fourth year aerospace engineering student. Good, aerospace. <laughs> um, and she's working in Professor Steinberg's group, doing research there. Um, and her interest are in propulsion and combustion. And in fact, you spent a summer working for Hermes. Yeah, that's correct. So it's a company, it's a startup company that's making some big hypersonic waves mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, here in Atlanta. Uh, and a few of our students have are working for it or have worked for it. And uh, you're hoping to uh, go back and work another summer before you start graduate school. Yeah, right? that's correct. I'm looking to do my BSMS here um, the following year. So in between uh, during that summer, I'm planning to go back and intern for them again. All right. Well, that's great. Yeah. Well, we'll all give a great round of applause for everyone out online. I'm sure they're chatting. <laughs> go ahead. And we're looking forward to your presentation. All right. Thank you, Dr. Seitzman. Um, so, yeah. Uh, my name is Kathy Liu. I'm a fourth year aerospace engineering student, and I've been doing research in Dr. Steinberg's group since fall 2020. So I'll just be presenting on um, some of the things that I did research on. So the topic for today is turbulence diagnostic methods for flame characterization in a swirl nozzle burner. So I'll just give a brief overview of what I'll be covering today. Um, I'll give a background of turbulence and why we need to measure it. Um, I'll go into the specifics of our swirl burner. Uh, nozzle and the geometry specific to that. Um, I'll also cover a few turbulence characteristics that might be of interest. Um, and hi, welcome. <laughs> and um, I'll just cover a few di different diagnostic methods. So if this will include hot wire anemometry, laser Doppler velocimetry, particle image velocimetry. Um, I'll compare these methods and then conclude with their applications to our swirl nozzle burner. All right, so just a brief background of turbulence. Um, so turbulence is characterized by chaotic changes in flow velocity and pressure. Um, and something that happens in turbulence is you have these large flow features um, that then break down into smaller eddies and smaller eddies until at the very smallest um, feature scale, uh, these eddies dissipate into heat. Um, and then something important to note is that um, there's no analytical solution to these equations, which makes it necessary for us to um, measure it in a lab. Um, and you might also wonder, like, why can't we just do CFD or other direct numerical si simulations? Um, and the reasoning for this is that DNS is very expensive computationally, um, and it's also limited by the Reynolds number. So for example, um, like a, even analyzing an airfoil in a wind tunnel um, with a low Reynolds number would requ require a grid size um, that is massive uh, just to like get the get down to like the very finest details. Um, so the grid size scales by a fact by the power of nine fourths with the Reynolds number. Um, so just as an example, um, a Reynolds number of six thousand would require a computational time of twenty months. So um, most real world flows are at least an order of magnitude. Um, larger in Reynolds number than that. So you can just imagine how unfeasible it might become to do that. All right, and then why would we want to study a swirl burner? Or what benefits does it have over other types of burners? So here on this slide, I just have um, a few different types of jets. So you have a simple jet, a Bunsen burner, um, a bluff body anchored flame, and the last image is a swirl nozzle. So um, the swirl nozzle offers a lot of benefits in that um, it is much more resistant to things like blow off. So there's enhanced stability and um, it's a much more compact flame, um, which is ideal for uh, aerospace applications. And then on this next slide, I just have um, a picture of kind of a map of the swirl nozzle. So if you go back to this slide and see the last image, um, you can see that the flame kind of propagates in this cone and there's um, an inner pocket of like recirculation in the center. Um, so especially in a swirl burner, the 3D, the flow is very complex and three dimensional. Um, and then this will prove important later when we talk about the methods that we'll use. 
So you have um, your flame following the swirl um, along this dashed line, and then in the center, your recirculation zone is very high in turbulence intensity. So these are the things that we want to measure, the, the main jet, the recirculation zone in the middle, the shear layer that occurs between those two regimes, um, as well as the flame edge and how that um, affects everything. And then again, this is of interest to us because um, swirl flames bring enhanced stability and um, just have a very compact flame. All right, so some of the turbulence characteristics that we would want to measure using these methods. Um, all of these methods measure the instantaneous velocity, um, which then can give rise to length scale. So um, like the size of the largest features in the flow and the smallest features, um, like the Kolmogorov scale, um, as well as time scales, um, which correspond to basically how those scales move um, through time. And then uh, you also have the turbulence intensity, which is just the variation in velocity over the mean velocity. And then there are a few other metrics that we'd like to look at, including energy cascade, power spectra density, um, and the turbulence stresses. So our ideal measurement, um, if we were living in a perfect world, we'd have very high spatial resolution, um, as well as high temporal resolution. And then we would also have um, the measurement completely resolved in 3D. So at each point, we would know um, exactly where the velocity vector would be pointing. Um, in our case, we would also like for this to be viable in the reacting case. Um, so meaning we want to be able to measure the flow uh, when it's just the fuel and air mixture as well as when it's actually lit. Um, and lastly, the measurement would ideally not affect the quantities measured, uh, meaning that the measurement wouldn't perturb the flow downstream of the, um, the probe area. So then, um, but we don't live in a perfect world, so we have to make trade-offs between these different metrics, uh, which I'll then cover for each different method. All right, so the first method I'll cover is hot wire anemometry. Um, so in this, a long probe stem is inserted into the flow, and at the end of that probe stem, you have two support prongs shown in this picture. Um, and then running across those prongs, there's a very thin wire um, that is heated by a circuit in the system. So the system supplies a voltage to heat this wire to a constant temperature. And then as flow flows over um, the wire, it carries heat away. And the system then has to supply more voltage to compensate for this. So you end up with um, a variable voltage measurement that corresponds to um, the specific velocity in your flow. So the way this is done, um, typically you would calibrate the probe before you take data. Um, to a set of known velocities, and you would measure the voltage at each of those velocities to create um, a polynomial curve. And then once you actually take data, you're actually taking the voltage data, um, which you can then convert to the velocity. Um, and then this top picture just shows a one-dimensional probe. Um, but this bottom picture, there's also probes that are two-dimensional, three-dimensional. Uh, this triaxial probe on the bottom shows um, a probe with three wires that can measure um, velocity in three different components. And then also something important to note is that um, since you're only measuring the voltage, which is a scalar value, um, you can only resolve the, the directionality if you know the mean direction of the flow. Like for example, in the top case, um, if you have flow coming over the wire, you can measure velocity, but you will only know the direction of the velocity if you already know the direction of the flow, um, like in a wind tunnel or something like that. And then just the discussion of those metrics that we mentioned before. Um, the spatial resolution is limited to the probe volume, which is around two millimeters by five microns, because um, that's how big the wire is. So what won't be able to <laughs> it won't be able to measure um, anything smaller than that. And then the temporal resolution is dependent on um, the heat transfer characteristics of the wire, and it's around 11 to 33 microseconds, although you would probably be limited by your data acquisition system before that. And then, as I mentioned before, um, in our case, it, we didn't consider it to be directionally resolved because you have to know the mean direction of your flow, um, which in our case wouldn't really work, um, especially for the recirculation zone where you don't know that. And then also in our case, it's not viable in the reacting 
um, flow just because the temperatures are too high, the wire wouldn't um, be wouldn't hold enough integrity to remain in the reacting flow. And then also, is it non-invasive? Um, no, because you actually have to physically stick a probe into the flow, which would then affect your downstream measurements if you choose to measure there. All right, so the second method that I'll be talking about is laser Doppler velocimetry, or LDV. Um, and in contrast to the previous method, um, in this method, you're not actually putting a physical object in your flow. You're actually just shining two lasers um, into the flow, and they intersect. I think this, this picture shows right here. They intersect at a probe volume inside the flow. Um, so these lasers create a fringe pattern, um, and then this fringe pattern is of lower frequency than the original beams. Um, so you would then seed your flow with particles, usually in our case, like aluminum oxide or silica oxide, um, just to track the flow and show where it's actually going. And then as your seed particles pass through your flow, uh, they reflect light toward the photo detector module. So if your flow is going faster, if your particle is going faster through the fringe, you are gonna get a higher frequency um, measured by the PDM. If it's going slower, then you'll get a lower frequency. Um, so based on the frequency detected, you can then um, look at the fringe pattern and find the velocity from that. Um, and then also in certain conditions, you can offset one of these beams. So just shift it in frequency um, and that creates a moving fringe pattern. Um, and then with that, as your particles move through your flow, you can actually find the directionality. So you can think of it as the same way um, as like when you hear an ambulance coming down the street and when it's coming towards you, you hear it at a higher frequency and when it's going away from you, you hear it at a lower frequency. Um, hence the Doppler effect. So, or the Doppler in the name. Um, so yeah, this is a, a diagram of how this would usually be set up. Um, you have your flow of interest and then um, a laser and uh, optical device that focuses the lasers in a certain probe area. And then you have a photo detector module that then detects the scattered light. And then how does LDV hold up to our metrics? Um, again, similarly as the hot wire, uh, the spatial resolution is limited by the probe volume. And then, um, which is around one to two millimeters and um, 100 micron wide. And then your temporal resolution is limited um, by your seeding density. So typically you would want around 10 or so particles in the probe volume at one time. So for a, a velocity of 20 meters per second, you would have around five to 10 uh, microseconds as your temporal resolution. And then um, for directional resolvability, um, I should have mentioned this on the last slide, but actually, so this is just showing a, a one dimensional LDB system. Um, but there are also systems where you can measure in three velocity components. Um, and basically for these, you would just have three different pairs of intersecting beams. So you might have one in um, like a green wavelength and a blue wavelength and a purple wavelength. So with this system, you can also get 3D velocity components. Um, so as it pertains to our metrics, um, we can directionally resolve it um, given the three different components. Um, it is viable in the reacting case because you're not actually physically sticking anything in the flow, so you can use it um, when the flame is lit, and it's non-invasive. Um, again, we're just using laser, laser diagnostics, so um, nothing is being destroyed or nothing is being perturbed. All right, so the last method that I'll be talking about is particle image velocimetry. Um, and in this one, you have a double pulsed laser, which then is shined or refracted through a series of optics to create a laser sheet that illuminates your field of view. Um, and then same with LDV, you would seed the flow with tracer particles so that you can actually see where the flow is going um, when you capture, like when you measure the light. Um, and then you have a camera that's synchronized with the laser to take images at each double pulse. So you can imagine it taking images like boom, 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 boom. So you always have like a pair of images together. Um, so this before and after image pair um, can be correlated to produce a cor or yeah, it can be <laughs> correlated to produce a correlation map and a velocity field. So you can think of it as um, 
like you have your before image particles image of particles here and then your after image and then you can kind of see how um, they shift like that and then i have an example on this next slide um I just have looped um, two like before and after images together. So you can kind of see how the particles shift upward um, from one uh, frame to the next. And then in post-processing, you can correlate these images together to get a velocity field like this one. Um, so just to give a bit of context of what's happening here, um, we're just looking at uh, one side of the swirl nozzle. So um, the area over here would be uh, the recirculation zone, and then this brighter patch that you see is the jet stream. And then you can also see that here in the velocity field image, um, you have a much higher flow velocity here in the jet stream, uh, much lower velocity in the recirculation zone because it's so turbulent and like mixing around. Um, and then you have a section of medium velocity where the shear layer is mixing between uh, the jet and the uh, recirculation zone. All right, so the system that I just talked about was monoscopic PIV, which involves just one camera. Uh, you also have stereoscopic PIV, which has two cameras um, pointing at the same laser sheet. And this works in the same way that your eyes does. So eyes do. So think about closing one eye and looking at uh, like a piece of paper or at anything. Like you're only going to see that 2D plane. Um, of your vision. But if you are looking at something with two eyes, you can see that depth come out. Um, so in the same way, in stereoscopic PIV, uh, you can start to get out of plane uh, velocity components. So this is useful because you then can get 3D data. And then a step up from that is tomographic PIV in which you have four cameras, um, typically on either side of the laser sheet, and they're all pointed at the same laser sheet. Um, and then the advantage of this as an upgrade from stereoscopic is that instead of getting just a laser sheet, you're able to actually measure a laser volume, so it's slightly thicker. Um, and then with this, your four cam cameras take images simultaneously, and then in post-processing, uh, you can put these together to reconstruct basically a tomogram or a volume reconstruction of um, your space. So this is basically like a 3D map of where all the particles are in your laser volume. Um, and then same principle, you just look at the before and after and correlate um, where the particles started with where they are then uh, to find the velocity field. Okay, so how it bears with our metrics. Uh, the spatial resolution is dependent on the camera, your camera resolution and your field of view. So in our case, we used a very high resolution camera, around 29 megapixels, uh, and our field of view was only around 20 millimeters by 30 millimeters um, in length and width. So this corresponded to a spatial resolution of around 200 micron. Um, your temporal resolution, similarly to LDV, is dependent on your seating density. Uh, so for the flows that we were looking at, um, this was around 3 to 15 microseconds. And then for whether it's directionally resolved, it is, um, especially since we were using Tomo PIV, uh, we were able to get um, the 3D velocity components of each particle. Um, and then is this viable in the reacting case? Yes, again, same with LDV. Um, you're not actually sticking anything in the flow, you're just taking images. Um, and same with non-invasive, you're not actually affecting the flow by measuring it. And then just to give a brief comparison of the methods, um, as for spatial resolution, you have TPIV um, definitely wins in that area, um, just because you can look at the simultaneous um, spacing of all the particles and give a much finer resolution, at least given the resolution of our camera. Um, and then temporal resolution, LDV seemed to have won, but um, TPIV was a close second. But of course, this is dependent on your seating density. Um, and like you would have to kind of like look at your seating density and then check. Um, and there's a lot of calibration involved in that area. Um, and then for directional resolution or directionally resolved, um, hot wire, at least in our case, wasn't uh, resolved enough because we didn't know always the main direction of the flow. Um, but LDV and TI 
PPIV were. And then same with viable in the reacting case and non-invasive. Um, since LDV and TPIV are both laser diagnostics, uh, they were both fine in the reacting case and they were non-invasive, um, which at least for our case gave us benefits over the hot wire. Um, and then, okay, before I move on, I just wanted to emphasize that a key difference between these three methods is that um, hot wire and LDV measure um, time series data in a, in, continuously. So you're only getting a very small probe volume, but you're getting continuous time data um, throughout the time interval of your measurement. Um, on the other hand, TPIV, you're getting simultaneous spatial data. So you're getting the entire field of view, a very large field of view, um, at the expense of uh, not having continuous time data. So there's different characteristics that you can get um, from both of these methods. And then as for conclusions, um, for hot wire, again, for us, it was not sufficiently resolved in the directionality. Um, it could be really useful for wind tunnel applications, like if you're investigating the boundary layer um, of, a, of an airfoil or the wake of an airfoil, um, where you know the mean direction flow. And then LDV, uh, we thought it could provide really helpful additional time series data, um, but only in conjunction with PIV. Um, and then we found that PIV and TOMO PIV were the best for spatially complex flame characterization, which was really what our swirl burner was all about. Uh, we wanted to see the interactions between the jet, the shear layer, the recirculation zone, um, and we wanted to see that all, that, all simultaneously. Um, and then just the key trade-off between all these three um, to really sum up the, the presentation is that um, because our flow was so three-dimensional and complex, uh, we wanted to prioritize the simultaneous spatially resolved data throughout the whole laser volume. Um, and this was at the expense of time-resolved measurement. Um, so yeah, that concludes my presentation and I would like to open it up to any questions. So again, any questions online, please go ahead and chat them and I'll ask for you. But we'll start with the people in the room. Do you have any questions? I'll start with, I'll start with a question. Um, maybe just a clarification. When you talk about um, directionality, mm -hmm. I, you, you didn't mean like three-dimensional. I, I presume you meant like whether it's going forward or back. Yeah, pretty much. So like the the key difference with the hot wire that we or the issue that we ran into um, is that since you're only measuring a magnitude, um, you can only find like the components if you know the mean direction. So, for example, uh, what we were looking at is that like if you have a recirculation zone and you don't know which way anything is going, you're just going to get three magnitudes. Um, so, you know, like how big each component is relative to each other, but you don't know necessarily like where that velocity vector well, is pointing. The problem is with the hot wire, right? Flowing from right to left and left to right produces the same signal. Yeah, it's exactly. Forward mm -hmm. back. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 There's a question from Andrew. He asks, for PIV, how much does the optical distortion through the lens account for error and how do you compensate? Yeah, so um, I'm not sure if he means through the lens, like through the camera lens or through um, like if the okay, thing. The okay, um, so typically for Tomo PIV, you have um, much lower uh, levels of error just because you have four cameras um, and they're all like compensating for each other within the post-processing software. So with monoscopic PIV, um, you definitely have that risk of a higher systematic error. Um, but as you add cameras, that kind of like, equalizes in the post-processing. So Andrew, if, that, if you have a follow-up, just let me know by chatting again. Otherwise, we'll move on. So why do you uh, say that um, PIV and LDV don't perturb the flow when you're, you're actually adding something? Yeah, that is true. So that is a trade-off that um, we were interested in exploring um, because 
the seed particles do kind of add to the error of it um, because you're not directly measuring the flow, you're measuring the seed particles, which of course have some mass and some weight to them. Um, but we can kind of mitigate that by trying to use very small particles. So the particles we were using were aluminum oxide um, around five micron in diameter. So very small and light particles that can track the flow pretty well. Um, and at least in our, in our decision about the trade-offs, um, this provided a more accurate measurement of the flow than, uh, for example, hot wire physically sticking into the flow would. Because you can imagine like the wake from the probe stem or something would affect the rest of your measurements if you have multiple hot wires or something in the flow. Any other online questions? Yeah, there there is different um, uncertainties, and it is also dependent on like exactly which system you use. Um, but a lot of that, um, like you can find in the specifics of like the manufacturer of like what exactly like percentage of the full scale that you can measure and things like that. <laughs> yes, so I have a question, just a general question about what you did. Yes. So you were working in Professor Steinberg's lab. Yes. Did you actually do this and uh, try and experimentally compare the different techniques, or was it already decided to use PIB and this is why you actually helped take PIB data? What did you actually do with them? Yeah, so my journey kind of started off um, with Hotwire. So we had never used the Hotwire system. Um, I was the one who was reading the manual, getting it set up, actually taking data, calibrating, all of that. And these are just some of the issues that I personally ran into when I was taking the data. Um, and yeah, it was throughout this whole learning process that I learned basically everything that I uh, explained. And then, um, so we kind of decided Hotwire would not exactly work for what we wanted to do. Uh, so then we were looking into the LDV system um, and it actually looked really attractive. We set up the whole thing. Um, it looks really nice. Like you can get a very nice small pro volume in the flow. Um, and honestly, we would have liked to do that. Uh, the only thing was that uh, one of the pro heads was damaged. So we could only get two dimensional flow and it, it was expensive to repair. So um, honestly, I, I think it would be great to bring that in um, along with the PIV data to get time series, as I mentioned in the conclusion. Um, yeah, if it eventually gets fixed, that would, that would be awesome. So which uh, PIV did you implement? Did you use stereo? We ended up using Tomo PIV. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that, that's, that was um, the kind of like the next step in, um, my, in the last two years that I've been doing research. Um, we moved to Tomo PIV, um, and then I helped set up the optics with that, uh, and we took data, and now we are on the post-processing. So these images that I had, um, I wonder if I can pull them up. These pictures I actually just took from uh, the post-processing work that I was doing like yesterday. So yeah. Perfect. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, it's called Davis. Or oh yeah, so um, he asked what software that do we use to do the post-processing? Um, so it's called Davis or Davis, not sure how to pronounce Davis. it. Yeah, <laughs> but it does some seriously fancy math, uh, like numerical methods to kind of track, um, like I explained it in a really simple way, but it does a lot to track uh, where these particles are going. Cause I mean, you can see like the light intensity varies from one frame to another. Um, like sometimes the particles disappear like out of the frame. Um, but yeah, that is the software so that we use. Human drawn circles, right? <laughs> uh, no, they're actually, this is just a raw picture. Um, so it's probably just a really bright particle um, that's shining like a, some sort of like abnormality on the camera. So then that would be a diffraction rate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, those are, those are probably something weird happening with the actual burner plate. Uh, I think we got a bit of the burner plate in. I'm sorry? Because it might have been wavelength. For one of the methods, we did like a laser thing. Mm -hmm. So there's a specific wavelength that you have. So it might have 
Yeah, so um, typically in these, so I think you might be talking about the this one. Um, so typically you would use um, visible light for these like raw wavelengths. So in our system we had um, these two beams were green light. Um, it, and that's just so that you can kind of like position your probe volume and like see where it's actually intersecting in the flow. Um, and then the reason why you would even need the fringe pattern that's produced um, is because your raw wavelengths are like on the order of like 500 nanometers or something like in, in very tiny. So if you shine, if you like have a particle pass through that and try to reflect that, um, you're not going to get very good data, which is why they intersect to form this lower frequency pattern that um, then is like easier to take measurements of um, in your PDM. Okay. Really good question. <laughs> All right. Let's thank our speaker again. Thank you.